Do you know the basic security controls that we need in order to secure a network? In this video, we're going to cover many of the basic technologies that you need to implement in your networks in order to be secure. But first, if this is the first time that we're meeting, welcome to my channel. My name is John Good, and here I get to spread my passion for cybersecurity training, tips and tricks, and career advice to help you go further. Remember to smash the thumbs up to like this video, hit the subscribe button and the bell icon so you don't miss future content, and make sure to leave a comment for the YouTube algorithm. If you like my training and you want more, check out my website at johngood.com to get access to training courses without distracting interruptions or advertisements. Make sure that you sign up for my newsletter using the link in the description to get a free copy of my ebook on cybersecurity careers. You can also join me on the Discord server. The link is in the description. All right, let's get into the video. Four concepts for access to our networks include not only ensuring that authorized individuals have access, but also that systems are secured down to an acceptable level. With Network Access Control, or NAC, our objective is to authenticate the user attempting to connect to our network, and then we want to perform a brief security check against that device. You might have an agent installed on your computer that does the check for you, or you might actually have to log into something like a web portal, similar to something you would see at like a hotel or a coffee shop. These specific portals are called captive portals. NAC solutions let us set all kinds of possible restrictions, such as requiring antivirus software, or even the location that somebody is attempting to log in from. The protocol that NAC uses is 802.1x. Firewalls are an essential technical control. The core objective of a firewall is to protect different trust zones or areas in your network. For example, our firewall might be connected to the internet, our DMZ or demilitarized zone, and our internal network. The firewall permits or denies traffic flow between those different zones. In a Cisco ASA firewall, zones are assigned a value that determines their trust level. Key takeaway is that the internet is always the least trusted zone and your internal network is the most trusted zone. You might even have firewalls inside your network protecting different segments of your network from other areas of the internal network. Let's briefly talk about the types of firewalls that you need to know. We have packet filtering firewalls and these compare network traffic against firewall access control lists or rules to determine the action. These are very basic comparisons. Then we have stateful inspection firewalls, and these maintain information about connections that initiate, which improves on packet filtering firewalls. Next generation firewalls track additional information about users, applications, and business processes, which adds to that sophistication on how they operate. Web application firewalls specifically protect web applications from attacks like SQL injection or cross-site scripting. Network segmentation is the concept of dividing our networks into different zones based on their trust level. Similar to how Cisco ASA firewalls operate, we can actually assign trust levels to different areas in our network to control the data flow. We likely have areas of our network that should never talk to each other, at least not bi-directionally, meaning both ways. For example, we might have security systems connected to a certain part of our network, but our standard workstations for users, they aren't gonna have a reason to connect into these systems. Using our firewalls, we can restrict this type of data flow. Now you might see something called a jump box on a network. And this is a special system that you must connect to first and then initiate connections to other special systems. A benefit of a jump box is that we can really focus in on the traffic that comes from that single system. As an example, if we only allow a certain application protocol to come from that jump box and we see it all of a sudden coming from another box, well, we can investigate that abnormal behavior. If you work in a sophisticated security environment, you might utilize something called a honeypot. Now, honeypots are a vulnerable system that attracts attackers like honey, but in reality, it actually gives us the ability to analyze what that attacker is doing. Using deception type techniques can be very effective, especially when we deal with less sophisticated attackers. Endpoint management is a growing concern in today's environment, especially as this remote workforce trend continues. We have to be able to manage and secure remote systems. Let's transition to some of the ways that we can protect our endpoints. Securing operating systems is one of the most important controls around endpoint protection. Ideally, we wanna use secure configurations to limit the attack surface. One of the issues that constantly exists is that unused services are frequently enabled. For example, a system administrator might install more services than is necessary to eliminate the need to install it later. That might seem a little weird, but trust me, it happens a lot. Or you might have services that are installed and then over time they're no longer needed and we just never remove them. Both of these situations increase our attack surface and they should be avoided at all costs. Look at how frequently vulnerabilities are discovered in software. If you have additional services that you don't need, it's very likely that they could get exploited at some point 
because they probably were neglected and not updated. Just like with patch management, we can manage configuration settings at a large scale by using group policy objects or GPOs in Microsoft Windows environments. GPOs allow us to push policies to entire networks or small groups of systems on the network. This is crucial because even just changing a single setting on a thousand computers might take you forever and it's not efficient at all. Let technology help you out. I hope that you're enjoying the content in this video so far. If you are, make sure to hit the thumbs up to like this video. And if you think of any questions, let me know down in the comment section below. Also remember that this training and courses can be found on my website at johngood.com without distracting interruptions or advertisements. All right, let's get back to the content. Within your organization, there should be patch management policies that exist. For example, the policy might say that critical security patches have to be updated within 30 days of their release. New vulnerabilities are found every single day and keeping systems patched is a real problem, especially in these larger networks. The good news is that there's automated tools like SCCM from Microsoft to make the process dramatically easier to update your software. A critical business flaw is allowing software or operating systems to continue to run as they become legacy or obsolete. You have to communicate this problem to the business. It's going to be a lot less expensive and less painful if you attack it early on instead of waiting to the very end when it's very expensive to upgrade. Some of the most common endpoint security software that we see is antivirus software, such as semantic endpoint protection. Antivirus software can actually go a long way for protecting malicious software from getting onto your network. Remember though, antivirus software is only as good as its definition database, so you have to keep it up to date. We can also implement host-based firewalls, such as the Microsoft Windows Firewall, and on Linux, we can use something called IP tables. Last, we can use host-based intrusion detection or prevention systems. Snort is a very common piece of software for this purpose. You can actually download it at home and practice with it if you want. It's not enough for us to just design a secure network environment. We might also be performing partial or full penetration tests against our network to gauge how we're doing. The main goal of a penetration test is to imitate an attacker, whether that attacker is an external threat, like a criminal hacker, or an insider like a disgruntled employee. So who conducts penetration tests? Well, it really depends on the type of test. For example, some of the compliance requirements actually mandate that an external third party, like a consulting firm, has to perform the test. Some companies even have internal penetration testing teams where that is their entire job, or maybe it's just a partial part of their job. If you're interested in learning more about penetration tests, I would highly encourage you to check out the NIST special publication 800-115. The document calls out three specific phases, planning, execution, and post-execution for a penetration test. Planning phase of a penetration test focuses heavily on the administrative information required for the test. Questions that need to be answered include, what's the scope of the engagement? What kind of timing restrictions are in place? Can we only test off hours? Who's approving the penetration test? Additionally, penetration tests are similar to other projects, so you need to know information such as, what are the success criteria for the project or the penetration test? What are the deliverables for the project? Penetration tests will typically start with a discovery phase where scans take place to identify targets and probe for information about services that are running. Testers should be seeking to gain as high a privilege as possible. This includes escalating privileges when possible and pivoting to other systems throughout the network. The more information that can be uncovered will result in a better test. Once the test is complete, there should be a comprehensive and detailed report of what the penetration test discovered. A good report should include an executive summary for our senior leaders, detailed findings for technical staff to analyze, and recommended mitigation strategies. If these reports are simply data dumps, then they are next to useless in actually fixing anything. Some companies might implement war game exercises based on the penetration test being conducted. For example, a company might wanna see if their security operations team can actually detect an attack without prior knowledge. Other companies might wanna work side by side with the penetration testers to test and then fix or tune tools. Security operations centers frequently are going to have reverse engineering capabilities. With reverse engineering, we take the final product, for example, a software package or application, and then we work backwards to uncover what it's actually doing. Reverse engineering could apply to not only software that we purchase, but it might also apply to potential malware that we discover on our network. When we identify potential malware, we implement a sandbox environment that isolates the code so that we can analyze its behavior. Additionally, we can reverse engineer hardware. With hardware, it's not out of the realm of possibility for malware or other spying devices to be implemented into the hardware that we buy. There's been several cases in history where compromised hardware was discovered. Question of the day. 
Which of these technologies do you have experience with? Let me know down in the comment section below. In this video, we went over some of the critical technologies that you need in order to have a more secure network. As always, make sure to leave a like, comment, and subscribe. Check out my website at johngood.com for access to training courses, not distracting interruptions or advertisements, and I'll see you next time.